We are, as Pastor John Mark told us, 1 Timothy 3, if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles. We live in a day and age of easy offense. Have you noticed that? You can't say hello to somebody without them being offended. You can say the, the, anything in the world, and it is so easily taken by some and, and twisted and become a source of offense. Can I tell you, there are some portions of Scripture that people that don't want to hear it find themselves offended when the Word of God is spoken. Now, I did not write chapter 3 of 1 Timothy. God did. So now the question becomes, am I willing to hear from God? Or do I filter everything through what the world tells me to find offensive or not? i got to believe when Jesus told Peter, get behind me, Satan, that Peter was offended. Would you agree? Yes. I'd have been taken aback. At least I don't know about offended, but if it came out of the mouth of Jesus, I'd do a hard look inside my heart and say, man, what is going on that he would see that in me? Don't be offended, please, by anything that God's Word has to say. He loves you. But he's not moved by political correctness in the 21st century. Okay? If there is something that is said in the biblical text that offends us, as society tells us we should be offended today, we have to reject that. We have to reject that. Name-calling seems to be really popular today. As a pastor... <laughs> I have been called every name under the book. <laughs> if we actually believe and live out the Word of God in everyday life, you're going to be called names sometimes, and sometimes by the people that are close to you, friends, family, children even. Have you ever been called narrow as a Christian, bigoted, judgmental, unloving? I don't understand that since God is love. I, but we've been accused of being unloving, puritanical, homophobic, misogynistic, racist, xenophobic, Islamophobic, Zionist, old-fashioned, out-of-touch, simplistic, ignorant, anti-feminist, domestic terrorists, and as one recent president calls us, ignorant people clinging to their God, their guns, and their Bibles. Hmm. They called Paul many of the same names in the first century, and many people that read his writings today accuse him of being anti-feminist especially in this chapter before us today. But I understand, they called Jesus a lot of names in his day and age too, didn't they? Here's the takeaway. Don't call anybody names. The world does all day long. And you go, well, I'm not guilty of that. Has anybody ever cut you off in tra traffic and you said, you idiot? Huh? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. Or worse. Without often thinking about it, those careless words leave our lips. You idiot, you nerd, queer, geek. I don't even know what the new names are. My, my kids told me, the, my grandkids told me the other day, Papa, you're so sus. I don't know what that means. I asked them and they weren't sure either. <laughs> but that's the kind of age we live in today where we just call off names. What's that mean? I don't know. I was one time called by a lady. She said, she said uh, you're a male chauvinist. I asked her, I said, that's a word of French derivation. Do you know what it means? And she said, well, sort of. And I said, you ought to look it up in a dictionary. Because what I should do right now, if you do know what it means, is slap your face. That is a highly offensive word. But we often say things that we don't even know what the background is. We don't know what it really means. Misogynistic is a word that most people can't spell, let alone know what it means. It means anti-woman in any given capacity at all. <clears throat> Paul was called sexist uh, by many people who have written his writings over the last 2,000 years. But what he's simply doing, as he did in chapter 2, here's how you should worship. Here's how you should worship the things that are important in the church service as we gather together. 
Now, we went over that in great detail uh, last week, but chapter 3 tells us that amongst the two church officers that are mentioned here, overseers and deacons, he's going to tell us how the church should look. It does not anywhere in the original language use the word bishop. There are three terms used for the elders in the church. Elder, pastor, which is a Latin word, uh, which means shepherd. Poimain in the Greek means shepherd as well. But overseer is the term that is used here. First of all, it is a masculine singular verb, or excuse me, noun that is before us. Masculine. Now in the Greek, it's a very particular language. It doesn't mean men and women pastors. The OS ending on that must tell us, must inform us that it is God's plan that the overseers and the deacons that are mentioned in this chapter apply to men in the church, not the women. Don't be offended. Don't call me sexist. God is certainly not sexist, but he gave spiritual headship to man. Go all the way back to Genesis chapters 2 and 3, and you will see that as the foundation of all that follows in the Bible. Verse 1, let's look at this. We're all open-minded, right? If you're, if you're offended, take a deep breath. It's okay. You will survive this service. <clears throat> Here's a trustworthy saying. Follow the genders. It is faithful to the Greek. I'm reading out of the uh, NIV. It's faithful to the Greek. Just, you don't have to know Greek. Just follow the genders that are here. It is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart. What gender is that? Male. It is not gender inclusive. It says male. Here is the trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, episkopos, the OS ending tells us that it is masculine exclusively. It is, not, it is not a neutral gender. It is not a feminine gender. You do not have the freedom to insert in here. It is feminine or means to be generic in its oversight. No, 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 no. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer masculine, he, masculine, desires a noble task. You say, but there are so many women pastors today. There are so many bank robbers today. That doesn't make it right. There are women pastors today. Why? I've, I've talked to many of them over the years myself. Well, I want to be a pastor. But what does 1 Timothy 3 say? I've actually had some of them tell me, I don't care what 1 Timothy 3 says. I want... Whoa, whoa, whoa. That puts us back in the Garden of Eden listening to Satan. Who cares what you want? Far more important to the Christian is what does God want? What does His Word indicate? I'll either be faithful to His Word or I will justify every inconsistency in my own life because that's what I want. I have to be faithful to the text here. Verse 2, now the overseer, and again, look, for, look at the gender that is implicit throughout this passage. Now the overseer, episkopos, epi, which means over or above, Scopos is where we get the word scope or telescope. In other words, the pastor has oversight of the church. I micromanage nothing. I don't run the women's group or the men's group or the teen group or anybody else here, but I have oversight of those functions in the church. Do you see the thrust of the word? Doesn't make me the boss, doesn't make me the dictator. It just means that God is going to hold me accountable for the oversight generally speaking, of all of the church. Now, each of the teachers is responsible to God themselves, each of my elders, each of the deacons. But it says in verse 2, now the overseer, again, nominative, masculine, singular, one, the overseer must be above reproach. It's an old boxing term in the Greek, which means Satan can't land a blow. Can't land a blow. There's, no, there's nothing in the pastor that Satan can lay hold of and say, oh yeah? 
He should be the husband. That would be difficult if you're a woman. But this man, this overseer, this masculine figure must be the husband of but one wife. It doesn't say that he has to be married. Paul wasn't at the writing of this letter. It doesn't say that he has to be married. It doesn't exclude divorced men from the role of pastor in the church either. There are biblical grounds for divorce. There are written throughout Scripture. First Tim, or excuse me, First Corinthians 7 would be a great place to start. But if he is married, he should have one wife. Polygamy began all the way back in the book of Genesis with the descendants of the evil lion of Cain. Lemex had seven wives. And, and you read about him, as I did this morning in my quiet time, in, in Genesis, and he was a despicable, proud, boastful, arrogant man who said if, if Cain, you know, if he killed a man, he says, well, I've killed a man myself, and, and I've justified myself, and he, he's proud and boastful and arrogant. Seven wives? David had a mess of wives. Look where it got him. There is nowhere in the, in the Old Testament that polygamy is expressly forbidden, but it shows you the fruit of that. You look at David's wives and their children that came out of that, there's nothing but turmoil, chaos, murder, conspiracy. In other words, it has deviated from God's perfect will, which is one husband, one wife for life. Adam and Eve are the representatives in the Bible of that. Must be the husband, the husband of but one wife. He should be temperate. That has nothing to do with temperature. Some people look at the word, oh, that has to do with temperature, right? No, here's, in fact, I, re I read a cartoon a while back that says, we are passing out cards to you this morning, and we would like you to put down your preferred temperature, and what we will do, the deacons and elders will average out all of your requests and set them uh, in the church from this time forward. This has nothing to do with temperature. I know some like it hotter, some like it colder. And the zones we've got in here, you may be sitting under something that's very cool. You move 10 feet away, and it's, it's a little bit warmer. Check out which part of the sanctuary fits your temperature gauge. Temperate means not given to much wine. Not an alcoholic. Not a binge drinker. Not somebody who's in bondage to any kind of alcohol. It doesn't forbid the use of alcohol. In fact, alcohol was used by Jesus at the Last Supper when he turned water to wine at the wedding of Canaan. He used wine. The Greek term is oinos. Some say, no, he used grape juice. That's not the word that's used. The Greek word for grape juice is glucose, where we get the word glucose, sugar. That's not what Jesus used. He used oinos, which is wine. I don't know where you stand on, on the issue of the personal consumption of alcohol, but you should do as God directs. Know this, drunkenness is absolutely forbidden. Driving while impaired is absolutely against the law. So if you indulge in alcohol, that's fine. I have no issue with that at all. But don't allow alcohol to abuse you by your abuse of alcohol. Be careful. I think that Satan would love to put any one of us into bondage. You know, uh, my wife and I, we have our our anniversary coming up here in November. Did you remember? It's the, it's the day after Thanksgiving. Biggest mistake we probably ever made. It's a movable holiday, you know? So which, which is it? To, so we've just said, who cares what it is? Let's just call it the day after Thanksgiving. But on our anniversary, we, we may actually pop a bottle of wine and toast each other, and I'll tell her how much I love her, and she'll tell me how much she loves me, and I'll have a drink of wine. That's what they did in celebration. They did that in the Old Testament. They did that in the New Testament. But avoid the abuse of alcohol. Don't let Satan get a foothold of anything in your life that's addictive. Be careful. If you have an addictive personality, you're probably uh, not a good candidate for drinking any kind of alcohol. Just stay away from it. Temperate, self-controlled. Boy, think of all of the things that encompasses. Should be respectable in the church and outside of the church. He should be hospitable. In other words, he likes people. He likes people. It doesn't mean that every Sunday 
I invite the entire church to come to my house after service and clean out my fridge. That's not what hospitality means. But if somebody wants to go out to lunch with you, you have them over, you should do that once in a while. Be hospitable. In fact, in the Proverbs, it says, you want friends? Be friendly. There's a revelation for you. And that might include inviting people over to your house or going out for lunch or anything else like that. But be hospitable. The pastor, the overseer, should be able to teach. It doesn't say he has to be the most gifted man you can find. In fact, what's implied here is he has to be the most godly man you can find. Giftedness always takes a back seat to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I have known and seen some pastors that had more teaching ability and giftedness in their pinky nail than I've ever had in my whole body. The temptation of the church to say is, aren't they godly? You don't know anything about their godliness unless you live with them for a while. All you hear is their gifted teaching from the pulpit, and we assume that godliness goes with that. Wrong assumption. How many pastors have fallen? And that's because they are temptable men. Their flesh is weak as anybody. And as anybody's, and if they let their guard down, despite having an overwhelming abundance of a spiritual gift, don't have the spiritual fruit to say no to sin. Give you an Old Testament example. Who remembers the guy Samson? What's he, what's he known for? Long hair? Lots of hair? His strength. He's known for his strength, and you go, and it says he was the strongest man on the whole planet. Wow. Was he the most moral man on the whole planet? Oh, my, my, my. Perfect example of a guy who's hugely spiritually gifted by the Lord, but carnal to the extent that you would never have Samson uh, to be the pastor of your church. You never follow him. And yet we make that same faulty assumption today. Oh, they're so charismatic. Oh, I send all of my money to those guys on TV. They're so good. You know nothing about their godly character. You assume godliness because of spiritual giftedness. And that is a huge mistake that undiscerning people often make. I hear it all the time, even within the church. Oh, Pastor Jim, you've got to read this book. This is life-changing. This book is going to be, you need to preach this book over the next 10 years in your pulpit. You just, this is a phenomenal, life-changing book. You've got to read it. And I'll look at the cover and see the heretic's name on the bottom. I ain't reading this. I know everything about this heretic. But what he's done is appeal to their flesh. Oh, God wants you to be filthy rich. God wants you to have a house on Maui. God wants to bless you. God doesn't ever want you sick. God doesn't ever want you poor. God doesn't ever let you down. He never, you know. Can I tell you, God's not concerned with your wealth. That may be your God, but it's not his. You have to be careful of that stuff. Well, I've seen miracles with my own eyes. That doesn't tell you anything about the source. If Satan can masquerade as an angel of light, you want to be careful. Don't just gullibly take everything in. Oh, there was gold dust falling from the ceiling. It fell on my own shoulders. Okay, where did it come from? The air conditioning ducts? Come on, let's not be naive. You know, well, I went to a church service and, and, and God polished all of my fillings. Why didn't he just give you new teeth? I'm serious, man. I have been told this by godly people, godly people that I love and respect, and yet I believe sincerely we're deceived. You hear that? Oh, I saw, I went to this conference by this famous heretic, and he was pulling people out of the wheelchair. A pastor friend of mine that was a bivocational pastor years ago was hired by that heretic to push normal people down front in a wheelchair so the heretic could go pull him out of the wheelchair and and convince the congregation that he just did a miracle. These are counterfeit miracles. These are proposed by liars and thieves that only want your money. If their net worth is more than a million dollars, walk away. If they got their own private jet plane, walk away. 
They may be very gifted. Do not confuse that with godliness or faithfulness to the Word of God. And last but not least, false prophets have always been more popular than God's true prophets. Ask Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah. False prophets were esteemed by the people much greater than those guys. We have to be discerning these last days. Tells you what your pastor should be like. And you ask, well, pastor, do you meet these qualifications? I am striving to with all that is within me. Am I a sinful fallen man? I am. Have I sinned in the past and been forgiven? Yes. Am I cleansed now? Yes. Do I pursue these things now? Yes. If a, if a candidate has a heart and soul that says, I burn within me because I want to be this man and, has, and meets these characteristics here, he might be considered then for God's calling as a pastor. Above reproach, husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness. That's absolutely forbidden in Scripture. It would disqualify a man. Not violent, but gentle. A violent pastor is a guy who's always looking for a fight. And if he's in a fight, always wanting to win the fight. He's argumentative. He's antagonistic. You don't want a violent man. For, for a pastor. I don't believe in violence myself. I, I do not think that I'm a violent man, but I know my flesh is as weak as anybody's, so I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. And he'll tell us how to conquer these wrong tendencies in our lives. Not quarrelsome, not contentious. It says... A gentle, like Jesus said, you know, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am, I am meek, I'm gentle, I'm humble of heart. You shall find rest under your souls. I, I have little use for people that just want to argue. You've probably known contentious Christians at some point in time in your walk. You want to stay away from those guys. They're always arguing, always fighting over or quarreling over something. I think they've got some unresolved anger issues and certainly have no place in leadership. You, you don't want that kind of a person. Paul warns, have nothing to do with vain and foolish arguments. We'll read that later on in 2 Timothy, but just wanted to pull that out for you. Verse 4, he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. Let me ask you a question. Children of what age? All ages. There's plenty of abuse of elderly parents by adult children. And you don't want that any more than you want sassy kids or preteens in, in your house doing the same thing. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. You know, sometimes teenagers struggle because they don't understand, well, why are you taking away my cell phone? Why are you keeping me from, from this or that? Or why am I grounded? Why, 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 why? Uh, and, and yet I believe with all of my heart that if the parent sits down with their children, loves on them, prays with them, and does that consistently, discipline should not be a major issue. But you've got to start young. When do you start disciplining? When they leave the womb. <laughs> I'm thinking that's about the time sin shows up, isn't it? Uh, you you want to do this God's way. You want to pray over your children. You want to pray over all of your children, whether they're just born or te teens, preteens, adults. But they must show respect. About the time they can't respect you, something needs to be done. Perhaps uh, uh, sit down with mom and dad over the, on the kitchen table and have a real frank discussion. Uh, it's hard when, the, when you get to your teenage years, but if you don't do your homework before they become teenagers, you're going to have a hellion on your hands when they turn 13 to 16. So if you don't want that, if you want, don't want some drug-doing, pill-popping, sleep-around drunkard for a teenager, 
you better do your homework from zero to the time they turn that age. Because otherwise, you're going to be trying to play catch-up when they're 13, and that's virtually impossible. That is so difficult because you've laid bad groundwork for a long time trying to recapture that when they're older is sometimes difficult. So please, start when they're young. Be loving, kind, disciplinarian. Pray over them. Pray with them. Introduce them to the Lord. But demand respect. I don't allow any of my children never have to disrespect my wife. That's not right. What can I do if they are adults? Little, but I can call a spade a spade if it happens. It says in verse 5, If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of the family of God, God's church, in other words? You know, I, I think that especially as a senior pastor, respect of pastoral authority today seems to be uh, problematic. Uh, there's an old saying that familiarity breeds contempt. Well, you don't want to do that with any of the leadership in the church. Uh, there are biblical commands to respect those in leadership, spiritual leadership in the church. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 12 says, Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you. Do you see the word oversight there? overseer, those who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Congregation to the pastor, the pastor to the congregation. Live in, live in peace with one another. Right? Otherwise, we let Satan sow seeds of discord, and we'll all walk out of here offended at one thing or another. And it's not as if there isn't enough events to go around, but love covers a multitude of sins. If you have a problem forgiving somebody, maybe you ultimately have a love problem. Because we're commanded to forgive, aren't we? In Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. In Calvary chapels, we have, all Calvary chapels have a board. It's not a board-run church. What kind of church government do we have Try to have as biblical a one as we can. Some have called it the Moses model, but Moses was surrounded by 70 elders. You remember that? He was answerable to them, as I am my church board. We have a spiritual advisory board here. They don't make policy, but I've got really cool, godly men that collectively get this. I added up the board members, each of them, and how long they've been in his church? 150 years. There's some depth there. There's some wisdom there. I would be a fool not to listen to 150 years of collective wisdom. So I always want those guys' input. But as the overseer in this church, ultimately the decision falls to me. I don't, we don't vote on the church board. You know what we do? We pray. We pray. That, there, there, is, there is a historical precedent in America for that. In the Continental Congress, uh, before the uh, Constitution was drafted in 18, or 1787, they reached an impasse where certain people wanted something to be included and other people didn't want that inclusion in area. And it got pretty rancorous. And Benjamin Franklin stood up and said, men, men, there were no women in the Continental Congress, by the way. And he said, you men, I advise that we adjourn in prayer. And they spent the next four hours in prayer over this issue. They went to separate rooms. They had a prayer meeting in the Continental Congress. Boy, I wish they would have that today in Congress. Wouldn't that be cool? And then when they all came together, they said, we want to glorify God. And they, they came to an agreement on it and wound up... Uh, coming from the hand of the writers of the Constitution. That is glorious. And the best way to settle dispute, not to force your own hand or demand your own way, but can we, let's pray about this. Let's search out God's Word. What's God's Word say about this? Let's bring in some godly counsel. That's what I do in our board meetings. What do you guys think? What do you think? And we look for a consensus of opinion. In fact, what I look for is all of them to say the same thing then I know it's God. 
That's a cool way to do things. And it seemed to be the way that Moses did that with his 70 elders. Seems to be the way, by and large, it, the early church functioned in the book of Acts, where there was the central leadership, but they got the input of the people. They got the input of, of the apostles. They talked about it. They prayed about it. And they made a decision. I think that's a great way to make decisions. We don't have uh, committees in the church. Well, but, uh, can I be on the committee to select the next carpet color. No, you cannot. Can I be on the committee to select whether we have durable toilet paper or soft toilet paper or really cheap toilet paper? You don't want really cheap toilet paper. But there's no committee to decide those things. That, to me, is kind of silly. Can we be spiritual? A spiritual man or woman says, I don't care what the color of the garbage is. I don't care what kind of stuff they got in the bathroom. They got some foo-foo. Kathy always puts some foo-foo in there for the girls and nice smelling. We get, the, we get the dog shampoo in the men's room. It's okay. It all works. We don't care. <laughs> to a man smelling like a dog, it's kind of a badge of courage, you know. Yeah, we're funny like that. But let's keep the church spiritual. Let's keep our dialogue spiritual because there's some really spiritually important stuff out there. And we should be focused on that, not whether the band members are all dressed in the same color or nonsensical things like that. Satan would love to distract us from the really important stuff. We can't give in to that. Verse 6, he continues, the pastor, the overseer, he must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. There's nothing that can hinder a pastor more than quick success in the ministry. The guy who starts a church, and a year later, it's 400 people strong. And a year later, they're on TV and they're on radio, and they've got lots and lots of money coming in. Building fancy buildings, stuff like that. No, 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 no. It says not a recent convert. In fact, the Greek word is neophyte. You can't be a new believer. Means literally newly planted. It's not a good idea to put them into leadership unless they've been allowed to grow long enough to put down some deep roots spiritually. Here's what we do we make the mistake sometimes of equating enthusiasm with godliness. Oh, we want a young and enthusiastic pastor. Okay, so you want a young idiot who's not been through anything and knows nothing. But he's charismatic. He's enthusiastic. No, 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 no. He's truly not enthusiastic because enthusiastic means literally from the Greek in God. But he's not old enough to, for his roots to have grown down deep into God. Can I tell you, I'll take old and slow and mature over youthful enthusiasm any day of the week. Any day of the week. The people that settle for a young and enthusiastic may be settling for somebody who's not biblically qualified to be overseer. Don't mistake enthusiasm. While admirable, it does not automatically qualify them from leadership. Maturity is required because pride is an occupational hazard in the ministry. The young guys believe their press. The 20-year-old pastor, oh, pastor, you're so young and youthful and your tattoo's so cool and your tight T-shirts and your bulging muscles because you work out more than you read the Bible. Oh, you are so hip. You are so cool. We want you to be our pastor forever. And they're gone next week. Got no roots. You need a little bit of maturity. It doesn't specify how much or how deep, but you don't want to put a neophyte, a beginner, in that position. Because if you think that Satan is on you, there's a bullseye on the back of every pastor I've ever met. You think you're picked on by Satan? Satan knows that if you strike the shepherd, the sheep are scattered. True of Jesus and true for every one of us. You want a pastor who's got some roots, who knows in whom he believes and has a deep and long-standing personal relationship with him rightly applies the Word of God and deletes nothing from it. Pride is an occupational hazard in the ministry. Don't let it get its hooks into you. Here's how it'll look. Pastor, I really want to be a deacon in your church. Pastor, I've got you. you I am your next associate pastor. 
you are automatically disqualified. Don't even say that. Don't even go there. You're not ready. Come back in five years. Talk to me then. Pride is an occupational hazard in the ministry. Beware of it. Listen carefully. It is the sin that turned angels into demons. Be careful of pride. Be careful of pride. There are many traps that are set by the enemy. Verse 7, he must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. I think the devil sets very unique snares in front of preachers, teachers, and those in ministerial leadership. Pride and conceit already been mentioned. Money will be mentioned down there in verse 9. Women, ambition, jealousy, envy, depression, low self-esteem. I've seen them all in pastors. Satan attacks pastors in very unique ways. So you should pray for your pastors in this church. We covet your prayers. I think that we rise or fall on your prayers. Let me just, just I want to say this again. We're all in this together. I need you every bit as much as you need pastoral oversight. I need you just as much as, as you need a, a spiritual father figure in your life. For some of you that are older, maybe a brother figure. Or maybe I'm the teeny weeny one and you're the 88-year-old, uh, like my friend Jesse, who brings wisdom to the table. Boy, I, I can't. I'm not out to embarrass you, Jesse. I'm just saying. So plug your ears for a second. You know, half of the time as we go out to church, Jesse says, Hey, Pastor, I heard you say this. And he tells me, Man, he's really listening. And he goes, What did you ever think about this? Did you look at it from that viewpoint? I go, Well, no, I hadn't. That, that's a good point, Jesse. I mean, he speaks life into me, and I think that's wonderful. The pastor that receives nothing and thinks he knows everything is a pastor you ought to show the front door. Yeah, just, just let him go. So feel free to keep feeding into me, keep loving on me, keep praying for me and my family, my children, my grandchildren, because uh, we are all targets of the enemy. But understand, I probably got more arrows in my back than you may have in yours. We're all in this life. There will be tribulation, Jesus said. We, but, boy, pastors, I have seen... So horrendous things come against pastors. And then it addresses the only the second uh, other ecclesiastical office that is mentioned in this passage, deacons. And the word here is diakonos. Again, the O-S ending is a nominative masculine singular. It, it is not gender inclusive. If it were neuter and could apply to men or women, it would end in O-N. It doesn't. If it was specifically addressing the ladies in the church, the ending would be A-S, but it isn't. It is masculine. You say, well, I don't like that. I didn't write the book. I'm just telling you what it says. Now, whether you were willing to bite that off and accept it or not, that's between you and God, but your issue isn't between you and me. Well, there are so many women deacons out there today. My issue is not with them. I'm only here to say what the Word of God says. Overseers are to be men. Deacons are to be men. I hope that doesn't offend you, but if it does, you're offended by the Word of God. Not me. Take it up with God. I know it's not politically correct today, but who do you think is right, God or the world? Then choose which you will obey. Choose who will direct your thought life on these kind, kind of issues. Deacons, likewise, are to be what? It says men. It says men. It doesn't mean women can't serve. That's not what it says. But in the official office, like you see in Acts chapter 6, where the first seven deacons are chosen, they were all men. They were Greek men, by the way, handling a Greek problem. The Greek widows thought that they were being overlooked in the distribution of food, and the Hebrew widows were treated with, with more favorability. And so the church said, okay, uh, Peter and, and the rest of the guys said, you guys, the congregation, choose seven men among you, and we'll give over this ministry of, uh, so the, of waiting on tables literally, so that we can devote ourselves to prayer and the Word of God. 
I got to tell you, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Sometimes the lawn needs mowing, and in the early days, I was the only one here to do it, so I'd mow the lawn. But I would have rather devoted myself to the study of God's Word and prayer, but I didn't have a choice. So you can feel free to help us out in the church with some of the more benign issues to be done, like lawn mowing and bush trimming and nonsense like that, or cleaning the bathrooms, and many of you are involved in those. And can I just say thank you? Thank you, because as my age progresses, I find doing those things, not only taking time away from prayer and the study of God's Word, but it takes a toll on my poor little body, you know? I mean, I just can't do the things that I used to do when I was 30, 35, 40, like all of you young pups in in this room. Deacons, likewise, verse 8, are to be men worthy of respect, sincere. Interesting Latin word, sincere, means without wax. You go, what? Here's what they did. They used to carve statues out of marble all the time in the Greco-Roman world. And sometimes, maybe you did this when you took your pottery or or, uh, clay classes in in high school or or whatever. Sometimes you hit a piece of marble and go, dink, oh, crud, there went his nose. Well, what do you do then? You know, we got a really nice statue with no nose. So they would mix up powdered marble with wax. And then they would kind of use it as first century super glue. And they'd, they'd put it in there and they'd pack it in. And they'd take the guy's nose and put it, go, put it on there and wipe off the excess. And you virtually, because of the marble powder, couldn't tell. If it's sincere, it's the real genuine article, not a repaired statue. Without wax. Is this statue I'm buying here, this, this beautiful Pieta or whatever it is, is that, is that sincere? Is that without wax? And you go, man, that's the real deal. Great, then I don't have to worry about the nose falling off when August comes. That was the whole point. Sincere means to, to be real, to be genuine, to be caring, to be the real deal as a Christian. That's what sincere means. It's a, I like that word a lot. The deacons must be sincere, not indulging in much wine. Again, the use of alcohol is not forbidden, but restraint in the use of alcohol if you so choose. Don't get drunk. Now, you know what that means. There's a legal definition out there in Colorado. If you drink more than a shot in an hour, if you drink more than one beer within an hour, if you have more than one glass of wine in an hour, you fall under legal limits that begin, uh, the, the cops see you as impaired. So don't drink more than that. That just makes good sense to me. If you want to get home without a ticket, do what the Bible says. Not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. In other words, they're not greedy. They're not in it for the money. They are called by God to be servants. I believe the deacon is called by God to be a servant and an uncomplaining one at that. If you're complaining about what you're doing for the Lord, you're not a deacon. You're not a, a good servant. Don't do it. Carries no eternal reward if you do it with complaint. Just back off and let somebody else do it. But these guys were chosen, if you go all the way back to Acts chapter 6, seven men uh, meant to address that, that issue. They can't be greedy, can't be pursuing dishonest gain. Have you, ever, have you ever been taken advantage of by another Christian? You know, I, unfortunately, I think a, a lot of us have that testimony, oh, took my car to get repaired at this Christian garage, and they really took advantage of me. I hear things like that not infrequently. And uh, the Bible says, you know those kind of guys that are pursuing dishonest gain? they got no place in spiritual leadership. And they should be gently and lovingly corrected in that. You shouldn't be doing that. You should be taking advantage of other Christians. Just because they got a Christian symbol on their business card doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to treat you like the world does. Be discerning. Be wise. Be careful. Be prayerful. Verse 9, they must hold, they must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith. That's going to take some time to mature them to that point. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. doesn't tell us how they're to be tested, 
But Jesus said, if you're faithful in the small things, you'll be ruled, made a ruler over much. So, you know, guys that we see that the Lord's hand is upon, and maybe God has a place in spiritual leadership somewhere in the church for them, we want to give them a small task first. See if they're faithful. See if they follow through. Boy, follow through is, I got to tell you, that's everything to me. So if you say you're going to do something for the Lord and you don't follow through, it'll be a long time time before we ask you to do anything else. You've not shown yourself to be faithful. There is not that maturity that is in place. But if you say you're going to do something, Jesus said, you let your yes be yes. You let your no be no. Don't equivocate. Don't tell somebody, oh, I'm going to do this, and then you don't do it. Be a man or a woman of your word. It is a qualification. The word diakonos simply means one who serves. It's an official capacity in Acts chapter 6. It's re referred to here. But the old definition to it is a table waiter. The person who serves you in the restaurant. They were a deacon. They're serving you. They're not serving themselves. They're, they're serving you. One of the two officially recognized church offices here. They are to be tested first. Probably in the small things. Good with follow-through, steadfast in their faith and actions. There's always the tendency to take a new, enthusiastic Christian and promote them too quickly in the areas of responsibility. Pastor Jim, I've been saved two weeks. Can I start a home fellowship at my house? That happened. And I said, what I'd prefer that you do is sit in somebody else's home fellowship for a while. See how it's done. Ask a lot of questions. Study to show yourself approved. And then we'll sit down with your home fellowship leader and see how that's going. Maybe they'll give you a shot at teaching on, on a night or two. Or sometimes they'll come and say, well, pastor, I really feel called to ministry. Great. What we really need help, we really need greeters at the door. Well, that's not what I had in mind. I kind of wanted to preach next Sunday. Well, that's not going to happen either. It says, let them first be tested. So we test you in the small things. But everybody's got their eye on you. They're noticing what kind of greeter you are, what kind of Sunday school helper you are, what kind of janitorial service guy you are, what kind of person you are. Is there follow-through? Is there steadfastness? Is there joy in serving the Lord? Or are you cleaning those bathrooms saying, man, I hope I get to preach in Jim's pulpit soon. Be content with the small things. Then you'll be made a ruler over much. Not a recent convert. Got to, got to test them. Well, he goes on then in verse 11, and he does talk to somebody in the feminine gender. In the same way, their wives. Now, it's a generic term, guneakos, there. And it's not, we're not sure if it's the wives of the deacons and pastors, or is it just the women in the church? But the term can mean the context seems to indicate the deacon's wives. In other words, because they're one flesh, they have to be of the same character. They have to be of the same heart. Because what you don't want in ministry is a wife fighting the husband, or vice versa. There are, I'm sure you've got stories to tell about oh, how this guy was called into ministry, but his, his wife said, you go into the ministry and I'll divorce you. Okay, they're not on the same page. So you, want to, you don't want to put that guy in leadership. It just adds more stress to you. Husbands and wives want to be on the same page. And if so, they need to be of the same character. So wives, those of you that are married, if, you're, if you, your husband needs to be in the Word of God, he needs to be in prayer. If he's ever to be used by God, don't nag him. Set the example. Set the example. Sometimes in marriages, Christian marriages, they are unequally yoked. The men are ahead of the women, or the women are ahead spiritually uh, of their husbands. And what you want to be is on the same page as much as possible so Satan doesn't create that division. That's all I'm saying is I want peace in your homes. I really want peace in your homes. And you say, well, my husband's not where he want, needs to be. My wife's where they not need to be. You know, and they're hindering me in the ministry. No, 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 no. God's making you wait for a reason, probably because you're not patient. Wait. So they'll pray for that spouse. Pray for that spouse. Set the example. They don't want to go to church on Sunday. Then you go to church on Sunday. You set the example. They don't want to read their Bible. You read your Bible. 
You be the, the bigger person. You set the example. Peter talks about wives that can win over even unbelieving husbands. And he says specifically, without a word, which implies you cannot nag them into the kingdom of God. Some of you don't know that. Some of you don't act like you know that. Don't nag. What does God, okay, ladies, can I just, just you and me for a second. What's God want you to nag about? Nothing. No, this is not YMCA. Not, no, you're to nag your husbands about nothing. You're to pray about everything. You're to set the example. Nagging gets you nowhere. You think your husband's stubborn now? Keep nagging. You'll turn that putty into rock in no time. They just harden up their heart. They, don't, they won't listen. So soften up. Soften up. You know what you do with a piece of clay that's dried to the point that it's desert dry? You add water to it. You massage it gently. You breathe back life into it, life-giving water. And then it becomes pliable. But what you don't do is take that piece of dried-out clay, husband or wife, and take a hammer to it. That's what you don't do. Be gentle. Be kind. Set the example. That's what the Scripture is telling us. So wives, verse 11, are to be women worthy of respect, just like their husbands. Not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be the husband of but one wife. Now, because of that being the same qualification of an overseer, I believe with all of my heart that the wives that are in view in verse 11 are the wives of these leadership candidates. I want my wife to support me. If she doesn't, how much harder would ministry be? I want my wife praying for me. I covet her prayers. She's got spiritual gifts she brings to the table that I don't have. She has discernment by... The reserves of her discernment are greater than the nation's strategic petroleum reserves. My wife is amazing. and she's got discernment, I go, wow. I didn't even see that coming. She'd go, yeah, well, that's because you're a guy. You're a guy. I have discernment. Yeah, you do. She, she saw it coming. Well, wise, wise, wise women. So husbands, listen to your wives. Wives, listen to your husbands. Respect them as the spiritual head of your home. And God may call them to be a part of the spiritual leadership within the church. That's where they're really going to need your prayers and really need your backing. So you be that kind of a woman. Verse 12, a deacon must be the husband of but one wife, same calling as the, as the pastor, polygamy and having girlfriends on the side. Or uh, I've heard guys naive about this. It's easy for a guy, especially a guy in his 20s or 30s, to say, well, this gal, you know, I know, honey, I'm married and I'm faithful to you and stuff like this, but this girl, she's just a friend. Okay, let's play stupid. Let's put the word girl and friend together. Now ask your wife to sign off on that. I, I got a girlfriend on the side. Yeah, husband of but one wife. A one woman kind of man is what God's looking for. Whether you're married or unmarried, you're not to be called a, you're not to be a playboy or a flirt or anything. Else. Well, I don't flirt. I'm just overly friendly. How come it's just with the women? I've heard every con there is, man. I have heard it all over the years. Do not be naive in these issues. If you are ever to be used by God, it is because we will act according to his word. Verse 13, those who have served gain well, will well gain an excellent standing in the church and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Although I hope to come to you soon, He's writing Timothy. Timothy has is, is, uh, picked up his pastorate in Ephesus. And Paul says, I really want to come back to Ephesus soon. Timothy was his son, spiritual son in the faith. He says, but I, whether, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, the house of God, the church, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth beyond all question. The mystery of godliness. Okay, that just sums up everything he just said. Whatever candidates you have in spiritual leadership in the church, they got to be godly. Men, women, they got to be godly, godlike. They have to be pursuing God. The mystery, how do you get godly? 
This, you want to highlight this one because this is the mother of all hot tips. This is the hottest tip you're going to hear all day, guaranteed. How do I get godly? Christ. Jesus Christ. He is the epitome of godliness. The closer you get to him, the more godly you become. Simple. So do everything you can to get into his presence as often as you can. Through prayer and praise and worship, the study of his word. Man, just get alone with Jesus and let him make you new from the inside out. Godly character comes from being in the presence of God. That's all it is. But in this day and age of busyness, distraction, and entertainment, you're far more likely to be drawn to those things. If I took all of the time that you spend on your phone and on your computer, would those number of hours total the number of hours you spend in the Word of God in prayer? If it doesn't, it tells me which God you serve. It also tells me you're not qualified for spiritual leadership in the home or out. It starts with godliness. You say you know God, he's asking us to make that a reality. Jesus, he appeared in a body. He was vindicated by the Spirit. He was seen by angels. He was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up into glory. Jesus is the mystery, the secret to all, all godliness. He's everything. He's everything. Can I, Jesus is all you need. Whatever else you think, you know you don't need a 72-inch TV. Did you know that? You don't need that. You don't need a Lamborghini. You don't need a new Rolls Royce sitting in your driveway. You don't need a new job that pays you $150,000 a year to surf the Internet. No, that's not what your greatest need is Jesus Christ. Here's your takeaway. All of us in one capacity or another have oversight of somebody. Whether you wives have oversight of your children or you guys are leaders in the church, all of us are overseers in one capacity or another, overseeing children, overseeing workers, overseeing churches. Godliness is required in all of those endeavors. Secondly, deacons are called to serve, but aren't we all men or women? We're all called to serve. You don't need a title to do that. In fact, those of you that think you need a badge or a title to do something in the church, wait. I'm going to put a blessing on you that calls you into service. You will be called a servant of the Most High God at Calvary Chapel Eastside. You ready? Receive this. Edominus Vobiscum, eat your biscuits. If you see a full trash can, what do you do? Take out the trash. Where's the dumpster? Right back there. Corner of the property. Can't miss it. Big fence around it. I've had people come up, you know, at the start of service. I'm walking up to the pulpit. Pastor Jim, this, this stall in the men's room is out of, out of toilet paper. Really? Janitor's closet's between the men's room and the ladies' room. Feel free to grab a roll. Put it in there. I'm kind of busy. Just saying. Be a servant. Because everybody wants to be served, but in the kingdom of God, everything's reversed. Be a servant. Don't wait for somebody to serve you. Don't wait for people to do it for you. Be proactive in this. Take the bull by the horns. Because it's easier to ask for my forgiveness than my permission. Take out the trash. You put it in the wrong trash can. Okay, we'll, we'll give you instructions on that. All are called to serve, but not all serve. Be a servant. Be a servant. The revealed secret of true godliness is a personal relationship with Jesus. To know him is to be like him. And that should be our goal and purpose, shouldn't it? I want to live a life that's pleasing to God. In fact, that's what we were told in 1 Corinthians 7, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Thessalonians 4, Hebrews 11, 6, where it says, it is impossible without faith to please God. So exercise your faith. Grow in your faith. And he's going to say more to Titus in the book that follows First and Second Timothy. He's a pastor on the island of Crete. Timothy is, as I said before, is stuck in Ephesus. Uh, which, but the same rules 
You compare Titus to Timothy, same rules apply to the same churches in all places at all times. So this isn't just the Calvary Chapel set of rules. This isn't just Pastor Jim's take on it. This is God talking to a body of believers that now spans the globe today and will either do it God's way or we're going to do it the world's way. And I have heard no shortage of nonsense coming from pulpits these last days. You and I should know the Word of God, grow in godliness, and be seeking to live a life that's pleasing to Him in all that we do. So simple. Let's stand together and close in prayer, shall we? Lord of heaven and earth, I see the way you have organized the church. Just like you called Adam in the Garden of Eden to exercise spiritual headship, gently, kindly, lovingly, so the overseers of this church must be the same. You will hold us accountable in many men these last days, in this day of ultra-feminism and sexism and every other kind of ism that's out there. Men are not allowed to take that role of leadership, gentle, kind, and godly leadership that they should. So help us as men do our part to live lives that are pleasing to you and to seek you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Help our, our wives to be good and godly wives, prayer warriors for their husbands, husbands to be the, the overcovering of their families. And we look for you to raise up servants of all kinds in this church, men or women, Lord. We're not interested in name calling. The world calls us all sorts of names as they did you, Lord Jesus. I don't care about that. I want to do what's right by your word. So I heard it. I see it. I believe it. And that settles it. It's a done deal in my mind, Lord. I will seek after you with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because I know that pleases you. Into your hands I commit every one of these precious men and women, the children in the back, all the praise band up in the leadership of this church. Have mercy on us, Lord. Tuck us underneath your wing to where we can feel the warmth of your presence. Close enough to hear your heartbeat, Lord. We love you so much. We lift up our praise, our worship, our hands, and our hearts. In Jesus' precious name, amen.